I think the most fun I ever had was with my godfather, who was with Red, who was Red Skelton. <laughs> my dad was a comedy director, so my two godfathers were Red Skelton and Milton Berle. <laughs> Milton was far more serious. Later on, he fixed me up with Elvis Presley. Sylvia and Sylvia, me. Sylvia and Sylvia me. And Sylvia and me. Sylvia and me. Sylvia and me. Sylvia and me. Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Hi, this is Susan Granger. I'm a movie and drama critic. Welcome to Sylvia and Me. Susan, I am so excited to have you here with me today. Uh, my, my passion is movies, uh, the theater, uh, old movies, new movies. You me know. too. <laughs> You're kidding. So what I really want to do to start off, because you have an amazing background. You're just not a movie and, 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 and theater critic. Uh, you come from a total showbiz background. Yes, I do. Okay. I was very fortunate to be born at the right time in the <laughs> right place. Although we didn't know it then. We didn't know it was the golden age of Hollywood. But that's where I was raised. And it was fabulous. Well, actually, you were born on a day you uh, I've heard you mention that it was the right time for your father because your father happened to be in the middle of directing, I believe it was Lana Turner. Yes, Lana Turner in one of her first movies. Lana started uh, starred in a lot of his movies. She was a good family friend. And uh, I was born right in the, you know, at noon hour so he could come see my mother at Cedars of Lebanon Hospital and go right back to work again. Because back then, Hollywood was a one industry town. And that industry was the movies. And the studios were like various fiefdoms. There was the Columbia lot, there was the 20th Century Fox lot, the Paramount lot. And I was very fortunate to grow up on the MGM lot. Well, um, yes. Not only that, but so you started off, you were born being introduced to kind of Lana Turner. You also started acting when you were about three years old. Yes. Um, I believe uh, you called it And Extra. Your first movie, uh, how did that even come about? Three well, that was, the first movie was Salute to the Marines. And I was three years old. And basically it was nepotism. Let's be honest about it. I wasn't a particularly <laughs> talented three-year-old. Uh, my father was a very good director for children. And he needed a child in this war movie. And there I was. And it was before the era of casting directors. And so he needed a three-year-old and brought one in. <laughs> and it was wonderful. I had a great time. My father, when we worked on movies together, which was great fun, and I did it quite often with him, I was uh, an and also, as I called it, or an extra or a bit player. Uh, and he would say, let's pretend. And that's how he'd set it up, that this little girl, let's pretend this little girl, and he'd give me a name of the child, say Marie or whatever it was, is caught in this situation. And I would believe the whole thing and I'd memorize the lines. And it was just all a game of pretend. And it was wonderful. It was great fun. Okay. Um, and that fun went even a little bit further. Uh, I remember uh, hearing you talk about uh, someone or something uh, called King Charles. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, my father, who went to the University of Michigan, got his degree there and then his law degree at Columbia, but he always taught horseback riding. And we always had horses, not at our home. We stored them at a place called Leo Dupe Stables, which was not a far drive away. And he taught me how to ride when I was very little, probably about three or four. And his horse at the time was named King Charles. And it was a big chestnut jumper. And I loved the king. I just adored him. And of course, I thought it was my horse. <laughs> and so that was the horse that I learned to ride on. And suddenly when we went to the stables one day, king, the king wasn't there. And my dad said, well, he had to sell him to Louis B. Mayer. <laughs> and of course it was his boss, so he didn't have much choice. But the king became King Charles, 
who became the pie in National Velvet. And Louis B. Mayer, when the film was over, gave it to the star, Elizabeth Taylor. And of course, as a child, I always thought Elizabeth Taylor stole my horse. And then as I grew up, I realized I was very lucky that was all she took. Okay. <laughs> so so you were um, an extra, an ad extra, uh, whatever you want to call from about the age of three till about- till 12, till he till passed 12. away when I was 12. Okay, and before he before he passed away, I just because there was one other piece that I think is absolutely fantastic. You had to do a balcony scene, Romeo and Juliet <laughs> for school. Yes, okay, I did. Well, MGM was my playmate. Uh, the whole studio, as long as I didn't get in anybody's way, that was amazing. You know, everybody was working. Susan, just stay out of the way. So that was my orders, but I could go to the studio with my dad, often did, did my schoolwork, and I could wander around the lot. Well, my schoolwork, now I was about 10 years old, 9, 10, 11, I don't remember, but we were studying, I was studying Romeo and Juliet, and I had to memorize the Juliet balcony scene. So I thought, well, if I'm going to be Juliet, I got to find myself a balcony. So I went to the balcony warehouse. Now you have to picture sound stages were about as big as a football stadium. And they were all over the lot. There were many, many sound stages, but I knew where the balconies were stored. So I pulled open the huge door for the sound stage. And of course it was all dark inside. And I turned on the light, meaning there are naked, naked light bulbs all over. This is not beautiful lighting. This is like a stadium with hanging lights. So I, found, I wandered around and I found the perfect Juliet balcony. So I had my, my little book in my hand where I was supposed to go up and rehearse it. So I climbed up to the balcony and I started reciting Juliet's balcony speech. When all of a sudden from below me, Romeo answered. And he was a grown up. I mean, it was a man's <laughs> voice, his voice had changed. So this is a grown up Romeo. Now you have to picture this. I'm standing on the balcony looking out, but I can't see anything below me. There's just a naked light bulb above me. It's just all dark and black below me. So I couldn't see who was answering. I went through the whole Juliet speech and Romeo did his part from below. And I'm trying to peer across the balcony, couldn't see a thing. So after we did the scene, the male voice from below said, honey, it's kind of dangerous up there. I think you ought to come down. Now, I knew I was in trouble. Obviously, <laughs> I had disturbed somebody. Uh, I was where I probably shouldn't be because this was a balcony warehouse and it was dangerous. So I walked down the stairs rather reluctantly. And there at the bottom of the stairs was the handsomest man I have ever seen in my life. His name was Errol Flynn. <laughs> He kissed me right here and said, we'll have to do this again in a few years. <laughs> okay. And, and I, I didn't know tell my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell your dad, huh? Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> now you did uh, act up until your dad passed away. Yes. Uh, when you were about 11. And you acted with some of, you acted with Abbott and Costello, with Lucille Ball. What was the most fun you had? I think the most fun I ever had was with my godfather, who was with Red, who was Red Skelton. Huh. My dad was a comedy director, so my two godfathers were Red Skelton and Milton Berle. <laughs> Milton was far more serious. Later on, he fixed me up with Elvis Presley, but that's another story. Anyway. <laughs> uh, we can get into that if you want. Anyway, Red was the most fun because Red just was a clown and he loved to play all the time. And we had a, we had a wonderful time together. So I think probably my favorite was Red. Uh, Lucille Ball says she carried me in her arms home from the hospital when I was born. And she was a wonderful teacher and gave me some great advice. But the most fun was Red. Okay, so now we do have to back up a little. Excuse me, he, he, he introduced you to Elvis Presley? That was when I was a teenager. Now we're skipping yeah. ahead. All right. Okay, so I was like 16 or 17 years old. 
And Elvis Presley had just come to Hollywood. And the way you get into the Hollywood social life was to go to the parties and you meet people and this is where you make connections and they remember you and you get cast. And so what, his, what the Colonel who was in charge of Elvis's career, Colonel Tom Parker, I think his name was, um, was a friend of Milton Berle's. So the Colonel, he, apparently they were having lunch at Hillcrest one day and the Colonel was saying, we've got to get Elvis to some of these Hollywood parties. So Milton said, well, you know, the way you do it is you date a producer's daughter or something <laughs> like that. Okay. So my stepfather was a producer, uh, also at MGM. And so they made an arrangement so that Elvis would, uh, there was a party, a big Hollywood party coming up and Elvis was to be my date. Of course, Elvis wasn't Elvis at the time. He was a very nice Southern guy, um, very shy, thick as a plank, not very smart, but very sweet and very much the Southern gentleman who picked me up in a limousine and he had sent me flowers before and sent me flowers afterwards. And he was very much the Southern gentleman. Uh, we went to the party and he sang because there was always somebody playing the piano and they said, Elvis, would you sing? And he sang one of his early songs. I don't remember which I confess. Um, and then he was very sweet. He came over to me, he said, Susan, is there something you'd like me to sing for you? And you know, who's your, what's your favorite? And I said, Frank Sinatra, <laughs> could you do any ballads? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, I will, but I have to wait till the Colonel leaves because that's not what he wants me to do. So he did. When the colonel left, he sang a ballad for me. And it was a lovely date. It was, it was singular. I don't think I impressed him any more than he impressed me. Uh, he was a very sweet Southern boy who wasn't very much fun to talk to because he wasn't very bright. Okay. So we are going to go back a little. I mean, I couldn't yes. just let that sit. I'm sorry. You <laughs> okay. said Elvis, you know. So uh, your dad passed away when you were what at 11 i was 12 years old 12? almost 13 his name okay. was s sylvan simon he was a director and he at mgm and then he became head of production at columbia studios where he did films like uh, born yesterday and all the king's men and he died when he was just finished casting and working on from here to eternity did you get a chance to go on the lot when they were filming From Here to Eternity or any of the other movies? I mean, the movies you've mentioned are just, you know, classic. Oh, I, I did go on the lot. I didn't, I wasn't doing any bit parts, no, in them, but I but... did go on the lot because it was visiting daddy at work. That's true. And, you know, when you grow up in this atmosphere, this is your dad's working atmosphere. And if your dad owned a grocery store, wouldn't you yep. go to the grocery store? Well, my dad had a dry cleaning store. After family. school, okay. Yes. Um, this just happened to be where my dad worked and many of my friend's parents worked. So, so that I was on this at the studio a great deal. Your dad, unfortunately, did pass away and your mom remarried. And I've heard you say you had two dads. I mean, you were young when your mom remarried. Right, I loved both my dads. So tell us about your, your stepdad or your second My stepdad was named Armin Deutsch. Uh, he was a producer at MGM. He wrote a book called Me and Bogey because oddly enough, uh, well, he interacted with a lot of stars, including Humphrey Bogart. But he was, do you, rem do you remember years ago that it was called The Crime of the Century, The Kidnapping of Leopold and Loeb? Oh, yes. Chicago, okay. He was the original intended victim of <laughs> Leopold and Loeb. Uh, but he happened to have a dentist appointment. He was seven years old at the time. <laughs> and they were going to kidnap him, torture him, and kill him. And he had a dentist appointment. He was living in Chicago. So they grabbed a poor little boy named Bobby Franks instead. But that's, anyway, that's part of the, uh, part of the book. And it shaped me in a way that I have great doubts about the justice system in this country. Uh, Leopold and Loeb, if you don't know about it, was a very famous court case 
where these two teenage boys planned this murder, torture and murder of a child, they admitted to it openly in court. They admitted this was going to be their crime of the century and they were brilliant at it. And there was no doubt about their guilt, but they had a wonderful lawyer by the name of Clarence Darrow, oh. one of the great lawyers of the 20th century. And Clarence Darrow never said they were not guilty. What he was trying to do was get them out of the death sentence and into life in prison without parole. And because he was such a clever lawyer, he did. Well, it ends up that Loeb died in prison, but Leopold was supposedly after, oh, I don't know, 30 years, 20, 30 years, rehabilitated. And he was released. He never should have been. He was released because of our justice system. So I have great doubts. I think a great lawyer can get you out of a lot of things. And Leopold went on, I mean, uh, Lo, Leopold, yeah, Nathan Leopold went on. I think he moved to Puerto Rico, had a family, had a life of freedom that he never deserved to have. No, he didn't. So let's go back to um, your stepdad. And he did not like you acting. He didn't think it was something that you should be- That doing. a child should do. Child, okay. Absolutely. He was totally against it. Uh, but he was very smart about it. He didn't forbid me to do it because by then several of my Sylvan Simon's friends, other directors had cast me in their movies because I wasn't a bad actress. I mean, I guess I was kind of good for that age. But in order to be an actress, you have to be very ambitious, which I wasn't. I just wanted to work with my dad and to be at the studio because I enjoyed the making of the movie rather than being an actress. So my stepdad sat me down and said, Susan, look, let's be honest about this. You're not as beautiful as Elizabeth, meaning Elizabeth Taylor, uh, who, if you're at the MGM commissary, could be sitting at the next table. So... You know, there were beautiful, a lot of beautiful women in Hollywood. You're not as talented as Margaret, who was a dear friend of mine, Margaret O'Brien. Uh, there are many talented actresses in Hollywood. If you're not as beautiful as Elizabeth and you're not as talented as Margaret, being an actress is a very tough life. It's filled with rejection. I knew that from my friends who were actresses. He said, you're a terrific writer. I think you'd be much happier being a writer. And I kind of smiled and thought, wow, <laughs> he's right. I think that's what I'm going to do. And that was the end of my acting career. But you started a new career when you were about 12. Or yes. Didn't you become well, I had, I had been publishing a neighborhood newspaper long before that. From the time I learned to write, which was on a typewriter back then, they didn't have computers. Yes. And I had a mimeograph machine or I'd use carbon paper and I published a neighborhood newspaper. So I already knew that a journalist was kind of where I was headed because that was what I considered fun. Okay, and you went to school for, yes. you got a degree in journalism. Yes, I went to Mills College where I had an incredible journalism teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me, <laughs> name dropping again. We, Mills we, College we mind. in Oakland, California um, was a woman's college. And we had journalism, I guess, two or three nights a week. Now, why they had the classes at night, you'll find out. The journalism teacher came in, a short, stocky man, big cigar, walked in and said, ladies, my name is Pierre Salinger. I'm night editor of the San Francisco Chronicle. I've never taught journalism before, and I don't think you can teach it, but I'm going to give you one class. Then you're going to come with me to the Chronicle. And I'm going to assign you stories. If they get in the Chronicle, you get an A. If they don't, you get an F. That's it. He said, either, you know, this is a sink or swim profession. So he taught us who, what, when, where, and how to put in the lead in the first paragraph and set us off on assignments for the rest of the year. And I fell in love with journalism, just adored it. Okay. So how did you go from a career in journalism to a movie critic 
to writing and reviewing movies and theater? How did you go from one to, well, to writing reviews? As with any, as with every career, I think it's it's being in, being in the right place at the right time and having opportunities. I got married when I was nineteen, so I left Mills College, went to the University of Pennsylvania because that was where my late husband was getting was in his residency. He was a doctor in neurology. Got my degree in journalism, and moved up to New Haven, Connecticut, where uh, we bought a house. And I got pregnant, so I had two children. And I realized what was open to women was being a housewife. Bingo. I didn't like that. I mean, this is pushing a square peg into a round hole. It just didn't work. So I figured oh, if I can get a job so that I can pay a maid or a babysitter to come in, uh, you know, then it won't cost my husband anything and I'll have something to do because I was really bored as a housewife. So I went to work for a, a radio station named WICC in Bridgeport, which was a very big AM station doing women's activities, uh, whatever that involved at the time, a lot of recipes <laughs> and housekeeping <laughs> hints, and, you know, your own little Heloise here. And from there to kind of condense it, I ended up being an anchor woman on Channel 8, uh, WTNH in New mm -hmm. Haven. It was WNHC back then, but it went to WTNH and I was an anchor woman. And I kept seeing movie reviews. I started doing celebrity interviews because I knew a lot of these celebrities who were coming through the Schubert Theater at the time with new shows. Mm -hmm. And I heard movie reviewers who didn't know what they were talking about. It was all pseudo intellectual claptrap, frankly. <laughs> and so I thought, this is, they don't know how movies are made, and I do. So finally, the director got tired of my saying this kind of in the background when somebody else's uh, movie review was playing and said, well, why don't you try it? So I did. And I discovered that was a lot more fun than rip and read of being an anchor woman. I really wanted to be a movie critic and kind of transitioned over, went to WMCA in New York and got syndicated uh, in magazines. So that was how I made the transition. Fantastic. So we have just been through uh, you know, a pandemic. We're at a point now where we're loosening up, we're sort of coming out. But in the meantime, movie theaters and Broadway and so on has been shut down for over a year now. You went and refocused because there weren't movies coming out in theaters. You refocused. Could you talk some, you know, about that and, and how technology today and how you know movies have moved towards big openings and theaters to where we are now well you know you've got to look back in history because the history of the movie business really explains what's happening right now when the movies started they started as flickers as they called them a uh, little black and white movies that were shown uh, basically in storefronts. You'd pay five cents, 10 cents, whatever it was to come in. Then they moved to Hollywood because the reason they went west was because there was sunshine there all the time. And in New York and New Jersey, it was very hard to get to film. So they moved out west. Then they, and I'm gonna kind of really condense this and the studios mm -hmm. began. And as I said, they were like little fiefdoms. There was the Paramount, the Warner Brothers, the uh, Lowe's, which was MGM, all of these different studios, and they had a brilliant marketing system. They would make the product. Now think of this in a business model, because that's what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. You make a product and you own theaters in almost every town in the United States. If you think about it, there was the Paramount, there was the Fox, there was the Warner Theaters, Lowe's was the MGM. Mm -hmm. uh, there were theaters all over the United States in every town, so they had a direct line to their distribution. And it was a brilliant marketing product, and that was how the whole movie industry really boomed. And during the time of the Depression, they'd give away dishes. 
<laughs> they offered air conditioning in the theaters, anything to get people into the theaters. Well, along came the 1940s and the antitrust laws came in, which meant that the movie studios had to sell their theaters. So they lost their distribution for their product. And that was the rise of the multiplexes. And all of this, you know, when you're talking about technology, television came in, mm -hmm. various others technology, you know, when the movies switched from black and white to color, when they switched from silent movies to sound, all of these were technological advances at that time. And at that time, they, you know, they were earth shattering. People said when television comes in, nobody's ever going to go to the movies anymore because they can get it free at home. And movie stars at the time were forbidden to be on television. That's how you got the rise of television stars. Well, what's happened now is that theaters closed down. So the distribution point changed again. And they became that movies that were already made were released on television channels. Now, there are hundreds of television channels. I think our set goes up to a thousand. <laughs> so the various movie companies being smart business people, you know, they never call this show art. It's right. always been show business. It's a business. Exactly. Bought up different channels there. Now there's the Disney Plus channel. There's this channel and that channel. Uh, I guess uh, CBS All Access just became Paramount. Yeah where all the Paramount movies are gonna be filtered. So it's simply going to a different distribution point. And what I'm saying is that yes, this technology is new, but it's opened up so many opportunities for filmmakers because all of these channels wanna buy content. And movies now can be made on, you know, on your telephone if necessary, but the, you know, the, the equipment is much less expensive than it used to be. So that's the answer to what's happened and what is happening. And it will continue. We'll see how going back to theaters goes. Uh, theaters are trying to lure people back in, not with dishes anymore or air conditioning, <laughs> but they're gonna low, I mean, I'm sure they're gonna give um, very low prices free popcorn up here. My husband went to the movies yesterday and they were giving free popcorn. So they're going to try for the big features that should be seen on a big screen. And there are some that should be seen yes. on a big screen. I, I mean, mean Gone with saw... Wind was one of them. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'll never forget when I they when they re-released it and sitting in the theater and the first time Clark Cable co comes on the screen and, and you heard every woman in the in the audience just sigh. I mean, it was, you know, there, there are certain things that really need to be, no matter how large your Lawrence TV is. Lawrence of Arabia. Yes, yes. Um, so- By the way, there's, can I tell you a Lawrence of Arabia story? Sure. Lawrence of Arabia was released in two parts, if you remember, and there was an intermission. Yes because it was a very long movie. So what the movie makers decided to do without telling anyone is that just before the intermission, there is a scene of Lawrence of Arabia on his camel slogging through the desert. The wind is going and they're all parched. And then there's the intermission. They had snuck in because there are a certain number of um, images per second, you can sneak things in, or mm -hmm. you did back, you could back then, um, subliminally. You don't really realize you're seeing them. It's just an image that goes through a Coca-Cola sign. <laughs> so that what happened was when the movie had an intermission, everybody ran to the refreshment bar and wanted Coca-Cola. It had been planted subliminally. Well, it was subsequently taken out, obviously, and it's against the law to do it. But um, many different tricks were tried over the years. I'm sure. Uh, where do you see uh, the role of women in movies? Where do you, have you seen a growth? Is there, you know, there, oh, a tremendous, a, a tremendous growth. As a matter of fact, forgive me, I'm just going to quote something here. Uh, this year, starting uh, three years ago, five years ago, maybe the idea of diversity and inclusion 
really became a part of the academy, yes, which meant it became a part of the industry. And we can discuss the academy awards if you want. But um, right now, let me see. Oh, here's here it is. As of January 2021, the Academy's membership was 84% white and 68% male. A record of total women, 70 women were honored this year. There are 76 nominations out of 235 individual nominees across all three categories constitute 32.3%. The study, uh, there, there's a turning point now. More and more women are behind the scenes making movies. The Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego State University concludes that a record 16% of women were behind the total top grossing films of 2020, leading up from 12% in 2019 and a mere 4% in 2018. Unfortunately, that means 80% of films do not have women actually in the top positions. But as with everything, you got to remember, 100 years ago, we didn't have a vote. That's right. So, no, uh, we didn't. No, women are becoming more and more influential uh, on screen and behind the screen in the movie industry. And it will continue to grow. But things don't change overnight. I'm not defending anything. It's just the way things have been for years and years. OK, um, that's that is so true and we have to remember that it does take time that we are moving along there are um as much as people say there aren't there are some better and better roles for older women yes it's not a question that after the age of 30 you have to start oh. worrying oh my god i have a wrinkle here or there or, and, and you're going to play grandma to you know a 20 year old um, so I see that growth, whether it's growing as quickly as most people would want. Again, we have to remember where we came from and how long it takes for change. Yes. And, and, not, lose, and not lose sight of it, because if we start getting exasperated, then nothing will happen because we'll move in the wrong, wrong way. So when you're reviewing uh, a movie, what do you look for? What are some of the key aspects, be it the, the acting, the writing, the sets? I mean, what do you what All do you of those for? things, the things you, you mentioned. First of all, it has to be entertaining. Okay. For me, you know, well, this is the entertainment business. It, how do you want to spend your discretionary dollar? You want to be entertained. So it has to accomplish what it sets out to do. Now, as a critic, I've always felt whether I like it or not is somewhat irrelevant. My husband may care, my kids may, but most people don't. What most people want to know is, will I like a movie? Meaning they are their family. So when I review a movie, what I have to look for is how well does it accomplish what it sets out to do? If it's a mystery, it has to keep me intrigued till the end. I can't know that the butler did it halfway through. <laughs> uh, if it's a comedy, I better be laughing. If it's a romance, I'd better be able to identify with the characters. If it's a drama, the same thing. Can I emotionally identify with these characters? And if the answer is yes, then what it means is the writer and director accomplished what they set out to do. And then you have to see if all of the other crafts, uh, the, uh, the lighting, the costumes, the music, all of the other things, followed the director's vision. Is it cohesive? Does it all make sense? And that's how you, you know, how I can evaluate. I do a gauge of one to 10. How well does it accomplish what it set out to do? Okay. And uh, in fact, you've recently put out a book, I believe it's recently, 150 Timeless Movies. movies. Yes. And the thing is- I have it right here. Let me just- <laughs> Go ahead. Right here. here we go. You know, when we think of the word timeless, we think of old. There you go. Um, yes. 150 timeless movies, uh, Susan Granger. 
uh, as I was saying, timeless usually means old. And to me, old is the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. When, when they start talking about antiques being in the 80s, I have to, you know, gonna, But I, that, I, that's, I, our, that's our age, not, not the age of <laughs> the majority so, of moviegoers. So a lot, a lot of the movies that you have in, in the book were made in uh, 2005, 2008, and so on. Um, how did you go about picking out 150 movies out of thousands of movies? And I'm sure you've, you've reviewed hundreds of thousands of movies. Uh, what I looked for were things that will hold up over the passage of time. And I actually started looking at um, Robert Osborne. Yes. of uh, Turner Classic Movies is good, was a good friend, a very dear friend. And I was on his show several times. And he said to me at one time, do you want to go through all of your dad's movies? Which I did. And they were wonderful comedies in the 40s. Some of them didn't hold up. Uh, the Abbott and Costello ones, I mean, and, and Red Skelton, they all went into television. So by the time you see them today, these are routines you've seen many, many times. Right. And they were original then, and they were wonderful then, but they didn't hold up to, this, to the test of time because they've been so often repeated that you feel as though you've seen this before, right. even though it's the first time it was on the screen. So what I had to look for were films that would hold up over the years and be new to my children and grandchildren. Uh, and as the years go on, that they would find them entertaining. So I know I left out a lot of people have told me, I, and I wish I could have done 300 timeless movies, but the editor said 100, we started on 100, and then I said, this is just impossible. So we went to 150, and that was where we landed. Okay, now for you, um, tell me, uh, name me about five of your favorite movies. Oh. I mean, okay. You so know, it's so, it's so hard. I, um, I have a lot of favorite movies. I was just thinking uh, one of the ones that was uh, derided during the recent Academy Awards saying it never should have won an Academy Award was something called The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, which I happen to love. It won the Academy Award. It was about the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. It has the best train wreck you'll ever see in a movie. Stands up perfectly. It is a brilliant train wreck scene. Uh, but now when you think about it, there aren't any more circuses. No. This chronicles a, uh, an entertainment that is long gone because of the animal rights activists. I'm not arguing whether it was good or bad. I'm just because saying it not. chronicles something that no longer exists. Right. So that, and it was star studded, it was wonderful. Uh, I love a movie called State Fair, the original one. Oh, yes, yes. In the 1940s, uh, which was the only movie musical ever written for the movies by Rodgers and Hammerstein. It then became a rather dreadful uh, musical on Broadway. Uh, it was not well done. It was remade by Pat Boone, but the original one of the 1940s is absolutely enchanting. So that... <sighs> Oh, there are so many wonderful okay. movies. Um, so we talked about the fact that you actually got into journalism because you were not going to be a stay-at-home mo mom because you were bored and there wasn't a lot for women to do. Back exactly. Then. Our, our, the role that a woman was supposed to play was that of a housewife raising children supporting their husbands and and by support i don't mean monetarily i mean you know emotional having dinner on the table yes. at six o'clock at okay. night yes. greeting them and if you look at the commercials for back then she was supposed to be in a dress with high oh. heels greeting them at the door <laughs> and with uh, beautifully quaffed yes and uh you know ready to make the home wonderful for him yes and you went on to have a career uh, spanning over several years as decades. a very- Decades, you can be honest, decades. Okay, decades, decades. 
uh, reviewing uh, entertainment and movies that really has helped people try to uh, weave their way, you know, through everything that's out there. Well, and it's how you, how you spend your entertainment dollar. Basically, movie critics are consumer reporters. Oh, there you go. And in the meantime, your children did quite well. Oh, I was, you know, I, I must admit, I have been blessed and very fortunate. Uh, I have two children. Janet is a marketing executive. She does digital marketing. I can run and get her book right now. She, uh, <laughs> Janet Granger wrote a book on digital marketing. Uh, she lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And my son is named Don Granger. He is the head of production at Skydance in uh, California. He made all the Tom Cruise movies, the Mission Impossible movies, uh, Saving Private Ryan, Pretty Woman. Uh, but he went into the movies. I remember, I, I feel rather guilty about this, but not, not too guilty. Uh, I remember he was about, oh, seven or eight years old. And he came to me one day and he said, Mom, can I be president of the United States? And I said, yeah, you can. Theoretically, you can. There hasn't been a Jewish president of the United States, but OK. Anyone in the United who's born here can be president of the United States. And I looked at him and said, you know, you'd have much more fun if you were president of a movie company. <laughs> I love it. So I'm afraid I pointed him in that direction. Actually, my daughter went in that direction and ran a theater for a while. But then as she said to me, I don't want to be a nonprofit. I want to be in a, a money-making business. Okay. Susan, this has been an absolute delight. I could go on and on because this is, as I said, this is a, a, a passion of mine is movies and show business. And, and, well, thank and, you, and, Sylvia. This has been great. Oh. Maybe next time we can talk about uh, the financing of movies and how they're being made differently today because of television, because of the distribution. So we'll talk about that in another time. Susan, where can people find out not only more about you, but reviews of movies and, and you're doing- what I'm, Where you can find my reviews, the easiest place, the least expensive place <laughs> is to go. Okay, let's be real here. Yes. Go to www.susangranger.com. That's my website. Mm -hmm. I'm also in, since you are based out of Westport, uh, there is going to be a new uh, online entity called the Westport Journal that I will be starting with. I believe they're starting the end of the month. Uh, I'm in the Western News. I'm in the Hearst Newspapers. So, uh, and of course on Rotten Tomatoes, which is the biggest aggregate of movie reviews and in various newspapers and other websites all around the country, but those are the local ones. Uh, and the easiest and the quickest is to go to my website. Susan, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sylvia, this has been so much fun. Let's do it again. We will. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms. And of course our website, sylviame.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned.